and functioned as a cause. I think that's important for us to understand, as a cause, not just a condition of poverty. This work is summarized in the book, Evicted. Matthew Desmond has continued his work by collecting national data on eviction to address fundamental questions about residential instability, forced moves, and poverty in America. With the support of a number of national foundations, he founded the Eviction Lab in 2017 with the conviction that stable, affordable housing can be promoted, that it can promote economic mobility, health, and community vitality. I can think of no better speaker to provoke thought at this luncheon. Please join me and Mr. Mitchell in welcoming Matthew Desmond. The Salvation Army Homeless Shelter, which everyone in Milwaukee just calls a lodge, so you can tell your kids, like, we're staying at the lodge tonight, like it's a hotel. And from there, they were on the hunt for another place to live. And they found this place, which was on 19th Street. But there was often no water. And Jory had a bucket out and was in the toilet. But Arlene told me, you know, it was 525 for a whole house. When we looked at that survey and we asked what happens to families after they get evicted, one thing that we found is they move into much worse housing than they lived in before. So if we want to know why some kids live with lead paint, exposed wires, no heat, no water. One reason is their families are forced to accept those kinds of conditions in the Harriet aftermath and eviction. So you guys know what happened next. The city eventually condemned this place and unfit for human habitation. And Arlene and the boys were on the hunt for another place to live. So she told Jory, like, we take whatever we could get, which is what moving looks like when you're in that kind of position, just taking whatever you get. And what Arlene could get was this apartment complex on Atkinson Avenue, which would mean something if you're from Milwaukee. But she soon learned it was a haven for drug dealers. In fact, the whole block was drug soaked and hot. And she feared for her boys, like any mother would. So for Arlene, why she moved, the fact that she was kicked out of this place, was really important for understanding why she ended up in such a bad neighborhood. And so we thought, can we test that statistically? And we did. We found that you can control for everything in the kitchen sink, and you still see families who get evicted moving from poor neighborhoods to even poorer ones from dangerous blocks to even more dangerous neighborhoods. Eviction pushes families deeper into disadvantage. So Arlene moved out of Atkinson as fast as she could, but she found this two-bedroom bottom unit duplex on 13th Street in Keefe. Big old hole in the living room window, carpet was just like filthy and ground in. Uh, the door didn't have a lock on it, so Arlene learned to lock it with like a plank. She slid into brackets. But she put on a good face, you know, she hung up curtains and she stuck a piece of cloth in that hole in the window. So the rent for this kind of place, which was located in a very poor neighborhood, which was in Milwaukee, which is our fourth poor city, was $550 a month, utilities not included, and that took 88% of Arlene's welfare check. And she knew that some months she would have to sell her food stamps to make rent, and her and the boys just got by by eating noodles and noodles. When you're paying over 80% of your income on rent, there's no money for like anything, or like clothes for jewelry or toys for Jafaris. So Jafar developed this amazing ability to transform like a bucket or a mop handle into like soldiers and tanks engaged in warfare. So here's the situation. The vast, you know, like Arlene is not alone in spending the vast majority of her income on housing costs. We should spend about 30% of our income on housing. That's our ideal. That's our metric of affordability. But that is so impossible today. The incomes for Americans of modest means have been flat over the last two decades, but housing costs have soared. Between 1995 and today, median rents have increased by over 70%. Then we might ask, like, where's public housing in this situation? You know, where's housing vouchers at all? And the answer is it's there, but only for the lucky minority of poor families today. So the vast majority of families, about 74%, receive, it's a technical term, it's like, uh, nothing. <laughs> Zippo, which would be a situation that would be utterly unthinkable when it comes to meeting other basic needs. Imagine if we turn away three and four families who apply for food stamps. So we have flat incomes, soaring housing costs, the failure of federal, state, or local governments to bridge the gap, which means that today, the majority of poor working families in America spend at least 50% of their income on housing costs. And about one in four of those families are spending over 70% of their income just on rent and utilities. 
70% of your income is gone at the beginning of the month if you run a roof over your head and hot water. Under those conditions, you don't need to like, make a big mistake to get a big bid. Like something as small as a snowball could do it. So for folks like Arlene, eviction is much more the result of inevitability than irresponsibility. So Arlene gave up looking for housing assistance like a long time ago, but one day just on a whim, she stopped by the housing authority and she asked about the list. And she was told by the person behind the glass, like, the list is frozen because on it were 3,500 families who had applied for like rent assistance five years ago. Which isn't bad, like the waiting list for public housing in our biggest cities, I think including this one, is no longer counted in years, it's counted in decades. I have two young children now. If I applied for public housing today in like uh, DC, I'd be a grandfather by the time my application came up for review. So if our lead wanted public housing, this is what she'd have to do. She'd have to wait like five years till the list just unfroze, till she was able to put her name on it. Then she'd have to wait another four or five years till her name crept up to the top of the list. And then she'd just have to like uh, pray that the person reviewing her application would ignore all the evictions she's collected while trying to make ends meet unassisted in the private market. When we think of the typical low-income family today, we shouldn't think of them living in public housing or getting any kind of help. We should think of someone like Arlene. She's our typical case. So on 13th Street, she found a bucket of paint and rollers and brushes, and she gave the wall a fresh coat. But not long after moving in, her sister died, and she pitched in some money for the funeral. She didn't have the money, but like no one else did either, you know, like she gave out a lot. The next month, she missed an appointment with her welfare caseworker because the letter announcing the appointment was mailed to 19th Street or maybe Atkinson Avenue. So her caseworker typed something into the computer and Arlene's $620 a month check was cut. We call it getting sanctioned. And she fell two months behind in rent and she got the big papers. So Milwaukee is a city of about 104,000 Richter homes. Every year in Milwaukee, the island was evicted 16,000 people. That's 40 people a day evicted in Milwaukee, or one in 14 Richter homes evicted every year in the inner city alone. We've now crunched the numbers in Cleveland, in Kansas City, in Chicago, and Richmond, Virginia, and we found that Milwaukee isn't even on the high end of the scale. Do you know who's higher than Milwaukee? You guys. So these numbers are scary, and they're hard to believe, but they're also only formal court-ordered evictions, and there are other ways, cheaper and quicker ways, for landlords to get you out. So Joe Perzinski was his building manager in the inner city, and he told me, look, for every eviction that I do that goes to the court, they're like 10 that don't. So what Joe would do, he said, and you know, uh, you guys are behind and I need that money, so I'll tell you what, like, if you're out by Sunday, I'll give you 200 bucks and you can use my van to move. So if you gotta get evicted, that's a pretty good one. I met another landlord that if you're behind and he's mad at you, he'll just take your front door off. We looked at all those kind of ways that landlords move a family out, the ways that are processed formally through the court, and those ones that are informally processed that never go through the courtroom. And if you count those two things together, and if you add up landlord foreclosures and building condemnations, like what happened to Arlene's place on 19th Street, you learn that in Milwaukee, one in eight renters is evicted every two years. One in eight renters. Not one in eight single moms, or one in eight people in deep poverty, one in eight renters. And for a long time, you know, like, we've written sentences like this. Low-income families exhibit high rates of residential instability, period. And we haven't said why, and then what we're learning is that poor folks are moving so much because they're just straight forced to. This isn't just a rhetorical point. If you control for evictions and statistical models, you learn that low-income families don't move more than anyone else. So if we want more family stability and more community stability in our cities, we need fewer evictions. We've now built the nation's like, largest database of eviction in America. You can go to this website called evictionlab.org, and you can look at, at evictions in national perspective. We estimated that last year, 2.3 million people were served with an eviction notice across the country, which is totally an underestimate. But 2.3 million people is double the amount of people that get arrested for drugs every year. It's 36 times the amount of people that die of drug overdoses every year. This is a huge problem of national scope of consequences. But we don't have all your data. Now I know there's people here with connects. So can I get some eviction data from Rochester? So New York data are like, eh. 
So if you do have this data or you want to help us out, you can email us at info at evictionlabs.org. We will take your data, we will clean it, we will publicize it, and we will help kind of spread the issue. Eviction is a problem that affects the young and the old, it affects the sick and the able-bodied, but the face of our eviction epidemic is just moms and kids. As many of you know, if you spend any time in housing court today, there's just a ton of kids running around. Until recently, housing court in the South Bronx had a daycare inside of it. It was a South Bronx housing court daycare because there were so many kids just coming through the door every day. And low-income African-American women like Arlene and moms in particular are evicted at really high rates. Among Milwaukee renters, one in five black women reports being evicted sometime in their life compared to one in 15 white women. That should trouble us, because it means that eviction is something like the feminine equivalent of incarceration. We know that many of our young, poor African-American men are being locked up, but many of our low-income African-American women are being locked out, and they're disproportionately bearing the brunt of the eviction crisis. This also isn't just a crisis that's on the north side of Milwaukee or the south side of Chicago. This is in poor white communities, which I write about a lot in my book. It's in expensive cities on the coast, and it's in inexpensive cities in the middle of the country. One in five of all American renters now spends over half of their income on housing costs. It's a growing problem. So Arlene went to eviction court, and as this court cost in Milwaukee, she got to stay two extra days for each of her two kids, and those days came away, and she was ordered to be out on a day in early January. Now, and I'll tell you, Milwaukee's cold in early January, and this was like that January, where the weathermen had been working themselves up and saying it could drop below 40 with the wind chill. But if Arlene waited any longer, the sheriff would come with a gun and a judge's order and a team of movers and they'd pile everything on the sidewalk. And they take everything, you know, like the mikas in the freezer, the shower curtain. So Arlene struck out into the cold and she called the lodge and other shelters, but they were full as usual. So she focused on taking what she could to a storage unit that she had sold half of her food stamps and a space heater to rent. So she finally found a room in a domestic violence shelter 30 minutes away from Milwaukee. She just lied about being in an abusive relationship to get a roof over her and her kid's head. And she was once again on the hunt for another place to live. So she called on or applied to 20 apartments, and then 40, and then 60, and then 80. I counted. She was accepted to none of them. Even in the inner city, many were out of reach. And the place she could afford it, she basically tossed everything she had at the rent weren't calling that either, and part of the reason besides her poverty was her eviction record. So if your eviction is formally processed, it's published, it's public, it's online for anyone to see, and if it's not, there are literally hundreds of tenant screening companies wait, waiting to sell this information to landlords, because from a landlord's perspective, this is a big deal. Many landlords that I spent time with said we don't take anyone with an eviction within the last two or three years, which is the reason families are forced into worse housing and in worse neighborhoods, after they get evicted because they're blemished. So finally, the 90th landlord, Mr. 90, said yes. He had a two bedroom apartment, 525. Arlene just told Joy, look, a home is a home. So two months after their eviction court hearing, they moved in. And when Arlene and the boys had unloaded a lot of the stuff, she just like sat down on the floor and leaned against like this trash bag full of like towels or something. And Jory came and he sat next to her and just pitched his head into her shoulder. And Jafar's came over and like snuggled in, you know, on her lap. And, you know, they just stayed like that for a long time. So Arlene um, got her stuff out of storage. She hung pictures on the wall. She liked things neat. So she hung a little sign over the sink to Jory that said, if you don't clean up after yourself, uh, we're going to have problems. Um, do you guys remember what it's like to be 14? <laughs> it's brutal, right? And so Jory's 14 and experiences like these long stretches of homelessness. Between 7th and 8th grades, Jory went to five different schools. And at his new school, he started acting out a bit. And a teacher yelled at him. And he got really embarrassed and he kicked her. He kicked her in the shin and he ran home. And the teacher called the principal, but then she thought it was appropriate to call the police. And when officers visited Arlene and Jory at their new place, and the landlord learned about that visit, he told her that she had to go. Kids are a big part of the story. They can prolong the time you're homeless after you're evicted. 
they sometimes are the reason you get evicted in the first place. You know, when we looked in that survey we did in the housing court, when we were trying to figure out why do you get evicted but you don't, we found that what made the difference wasn't your race, it wasn't your gender, it wasn't even how much you owed your landlord. It was kids. The chance of you getting evicted triple in housing court, all else equal, and what you're seeing in that finding is landlord discretion. You're seeing a bunch of landlords say, I'll work with you, but not with you. Because, you know, my kids like tear the curtains down, they flush toys on the toilet, cause some dude whose car just been smacked with a snowball to kick your door in. One landlord told me, you know, kids cause us headache. Discriminating against kids is illegal, but many of us don't even recognize that as a form of discrimination. So after that eviction, um, Arlene started to unravel a little bit. She told me, it's like I got a curse on me. It won't stop for nothing. Sometimes I find my body trembling or shaking. I'm tired, but I can't sleep. I'm fixing to have a nervous breakdown. My body's trying to shut down. Um, I published a study recently that showed that moms who get evicted experience higher rates of depression about two years later. It sticks with you. And between 2005 and 2010, years where housing costs were soaring, something else was going on too across the country, which were suicides attributed to eviction. They doubled during that five year time span. Charlene <coughs> told me, just my soul is messed up. I wish my life were different. I wish that when I be an old lady, I could sit back and look at my kids and they'd be grown. And they, you know, become something, something more than me. And we'll all be together and be laughing. We'll be remembering stuff like this and be laughing at it. You know, like the home is the center of life. It's our um, like refuge from more pressure of school. Uh, and language is spoken all over the world. The word for home encompasses not just shelter, but like warmth and family, community. In ancient Egypt, the hieroglyph for home was the same one as a mother. So eviction causes loss. Families lose not only their home, but you lose your school if you're a kid, you lose your network, your neighborhood, you often lose your stuff. If you're taken by movers and piled on the sidewalk, it takes a good amount of time and money to build up a home and eviction you just delete all that. And eviction comes with this mark and this blemish, which can prevent you from moving into safe housing in a decent neighborhood. It can also prevent you from moving into public housing. Because many of our public housing associations, even though you don't have to, count eviction is a mark against your application, which means you're systematically denying housing help the families that need it the most. So we push those families deeper into disadvantage, and we push them into slum housing. We have a study that shows that eviction causes job loss. And if any of y'all in this room have been evicted, you know exactly why that is. It's such a consuming, stressful event. It causes you to make mistakes at work, lose your footing in the labor market. And then there's the effect that eviction has on your soul, or your mental health. And I think when we add all that up, we have to conclude that eviction, which used to be rare in this country, which used to draw crowds, it's not just a condition of poverty, it's also a cause of poverty. It's making things worse and it's leaving a deep and jagged scar on the next generation, which means we can't fix poverty in America without fixing housing. So how do we fix it? Stuart, you wanna take it from here? <laughs> <laughs> so imagine if every family in Rochester in America had a decent, affordable place to live. If Arlene didn't have to give 80% of her income on rent, she could keep her kids fed and clothed and off the streets. We know from previous research that when families finally receive housing assistance, like when they finally receive a voucher after years on the waiting list, this ticket, 
that allows them to pay only 30% of their income on housing instead of 60 or 70. They do one consistent thing with their freedom money. They take it to the grocery store. They buy more food and their kids become stronger and healthier. They work for the lucky minority of poor families today. But the vast majority of our families aren't so lucky, and their kids, with names like Jory and Jafaris, aren't getting enough to eat because the rent eats first. And like, if we can't afford the freedoms this country offers us, we got a roof over our head, basic stuff, the freedom to better ourselves, to protect our children, to be part of a community, then isn't access to a decent, affordable home, shouldn't that be part of what it means to like, live here, to be an American? We've affirmed provision in old age, access to 12 years of education, basic nutrition, to be rights in this country. Why? Because we believe those things are fundamental to human vitality and flourishing. Show me an argument that says housing isn't fundamental to those things too. I think housing should be a right in this country, and the reason is simple. Without it, without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. So then the question is, okay, well then how do we deliver on that application? And here I just want to say, there's a lot of good news actually. There's a lot of good news. You know, like just a few generations ago, there were slums in our cities. There were babies dying of tuberculosis. There were outhouses in the middle of Philadelphia when some of y'all were still alive. But we took on a battle with the slum and we won. And I'll be the first to admit we still have a long way to go. Like when I lived in the trailer park, I didn't have any hot water. And I told the landlord, like, hey, I'm a writer, and I'm going to write about you in your trailer park. Uh, I get it. But there's no denying we haven't made huge steps forward in the right direction when it comes to quality of housing folks are living in today. I just think that's important to recognize. A lot of times when we talk about these issues, poverty, racism, it can feel so entrenched and eternal. And we can start telling ourselves things like, we throw all this money at the problem and nothing ever works. That's not true. It's like some of our neighborhoods have stage four cancer or we try to dose it with two aspirin and we wonder why it doesn't work. When we as a country wanted to take on big problems, we have come up with big solutions. I also just take a lot of heart in the work that's going on from people all around this room, leaders all around this room, that are driving out family homelessness, preserving our affordable housing and fighting evictions. So one thing that I've done with proceeds from this book to to amplify those efforts is create a website called Just Shelter. So readers can go on this map, click on New York, see what's going down in Rochester, and understand the problem in their own backyards, and maybe get plugged in with their own time and their own community. The battle here is block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, and I have so much respect for all of you that have devoted your time and been fighting this battle for longer than I've been alive. So thank you for your work. So what's the bigger issue, the bigger kind of solution? I think a problem as big as the affordable housing crisis, it calls for a big solution. We're bleeding out, and it'd be pretty disingenuous of me to stand up here and say, you know, a band-aid fix will do it. We can nudge this one away, we can't. We need bold political leadership on this. We need moral clarity on this issue. So one idea, not even mine, that would make a dream of affordable housing a reality would be to take this program that we already have, this Housing Choice Voucher Program, and expand it to everyone below the poverty line. So if you qualify for this program, you wouldn't get put on a waiting list, you could get help. And you take that ticket, and you go into the private rental market, and you can live anywhere you want, as long as your housing wasn't too expensive or too shoddy, and instead of paying 60, 70, 80% of your income on rent, you would pay 30, the voucher would cover the rest. That would fundamentally change the face of poverty in America. That would drive down homelessness and evictions. That would make, you know, this like, <sighs> that you feel when you're spending what you should be spending on housing. That would allow families to root down in communities and like understand the value of a home. So let's ask two quick questions about this. One, would that be a disincentive to work? Most studies say absolutely not. And the truth is the status quo is a much bigger threat to self-sufficiency and work than any affordable housing program could be. I mean, families that are crushed by the high cost of housing can't afford job training, community college classes, they could get plugged into a better place in the labor market. Most can't afford to stay in one place long enough to just hold down a job. And just think of all the brain power and creativity that we just squander. Because we have someone like Arlene who's been so much of hers trying to figure out how she's gonna make rent from one month to the next. 
Poverty reduces people towards better things. Arlene didn't want some small life. Poverty is complicated, but a stable, affordable home gives folks like her a shot at realizing their full potential. Second question. A universal housing program sounds kind of expensive. Can we afford it? It's totally expensive. We can totally afford it. So, Bipartisan Policy Center crunched the numbers a few years ago, and they said the thing that I'm kind of suggesting this morning would give, you know, would require an additional $22 billion every year. $22 billion is not a small figure. But it's well within our capacity. We have the money, we just made decisions about how to spend it. So every year in this country, homeowner tax subsidies, including and especially the mortgage interest deduction that many of us just claimed on our taxes, those subsidies far, far outpace direct housing assistance to the needy. We already have a national housing program. It's an entitlement. It's just not for poor people. So the year that Arlene was evicted from 13th Street, we as a country spent $41 billion on things like Section 8, public housing, every single program related to affordable housing, $41 billion. That same year, we spent $171 billion on homeowner tax subsidies. That number, $171 billion, was equivalent to the entire budgets of the Departments of Education, Veteran Affairs, Homeland Security, Justice, and Agriculture combined. That's a rather large figure. Most of that benefit goes to families with six-figure incomes. Most white families own their home in America. Most black and Latinos do not because of our legacy of racial discrimination. It is hard to imagine a social policy that does a better job of increasing our economic and racial disparities than our current housing policy does. So if we're gonna spend the bulk of our public dollars on the rich, at least when it comes to like housing, let's just be honest about that. Let's just own up to that. Be like, yes, we like it this way. We want this social contract. Instead of repeating this lie that the richest country on the planet can't afford to do more. If poverty persists in America, it's not for lack of resources. We lack something else. Okay, so that's one, that's one idea. Like, let others come. Uh, cities are different. They have different challenges, different gifts. Our public policy should recognize that. But whatever our way out of this, I think one thing is certain, this uh, degree of inequality and this level of social suffering, this like just cold denial of a basic human need, and this blunting of human potential, like this isn't us. This does not have to be us. By no American value is this situation justified. There's no ethical code, there's no holy teaching, there's no piece of scripture. It can be someone to defend what we've allowed our country to become. So, thank you so much, Lorraine and everyone. Appreciate you.